Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Geopolitics with Granary. My name is Lee Woolley. I'm the president of the Mid-Atlantic Region for Bank of New York Mellon Wealth Management. Uh, delighted to be a, uh, a sponsor of Geopolitics with Granary for uh, quite a while now. And also uh, thrilled just to be associated with FPRI. Uh, when I moved to the area here about three years ago, the uh, FPRI initials definitely did not roll off my tongue. Uh, they definitely do these days, and I'm just really proud to be affiliated with this organization and all the marvelous content uh, that is produced. Um, I think we're in for a real treat tonight with uh, David and Ron, uh, but to kick things off, I'm going to turn things over immediately to uh, our regal president, uh, Mr. Alan Luxenberg. Alan? Thanks, Lee, for those uh, work, kind words about FPRI, and thanks for your support of uh, this series. Thanks also go to the National Liberty Museum, which is the host of our series for the season, and going backward and going forward. So uh, we're, we're very glad to be here. Uh, I'm really not going to take any time. Um, you know that uh, we've been selling this hat, Make America Think Again. It uh, really derives quite logically from our longtime slogan, which is that a nation must think before it acts, uh, which is what we were founded to do. And uh, we try to bring, broaden and deepen public understanding of important uh, national security and foreign policy issues. And we ask for your support uh, to make sure that mission keeps going. It's now probably more essential than ever. So thank you for joining us tonight, and I hope you enjoy the evening program. Thank you, Alan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Tuesday in Philadelphia, and the world is as complicated as ever, so let's talk about it. Welcome to the February 2017 edition of Geopolitics with Granary, FBI's monthly discussion of international affairs. I'm Ron Granary, FBI's director of the Center for the Study of American Arrest, your host and moderator of tonight's discussion. Uh, all of us at FPRI, thank you for joining us tonight, live and archived on the internet, and live this evening here at the, on February 7th, 2017 at the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. The Greek historian Heraclitus tells us that war is the father of all things. Ever since Cain slew Abel out of resentment over Abel's closer relationship to the Lord, violent struggle has shaped civilization. As ever larger groups have competed for control of territory and resources, or in the name of any number of philosophical or religious principles, each claiming for itself the right to assert control over the bodies, living or dead, of their competitors. The more intimate the struggle, the more painful the wounds. What is true in individual life is as true in political life. Thus, civil wars can be the most painful and the most difficult to define. They last longer, are harder to end by diplomacy, and therefore require each side to seek a definitive military triumph that may be impossible to achieve. Such conflicts are not only more violent, but they have become, in the past half century, increasingly frequent. Our guest tonight, David Armitage, notes in his most recent book, Civil Wars, A History in Ideas, that civil war has gradually become the most widespread, the most destructive, and the most characteristic form of human violence. But at the same time, no form of war is more nominally contentious than civil war. In a work of international intellectual history that spans Western civilization from the Greeks to the present, hence my opening reference to Heraclitus to try to keep up, Professor Armitage shows just how contentious that process can be, not only in the sense of the terrible violence that tears communities apart, but in the ongoing intellectual challenge to describe such conflicts. With an impressively broad temporal and literary sweep, this book is a history of ideas, but more than that, as the subtitle indicates, it is a history in ideas, an attempt to make sense of one aspect of human society by studying the ideas that have guided human understanding of the subject. 
The Romans were the first theorists of civil war as they attempted to make sense of the upheavals that plagued the Republic and led to the formation of the empire. Rome itself was, according to its own legends, founded on a fratricidal conflict between Romulus and Remus and experienced a wave of conflicts, especially in the last two centuries BCE. Roman assumptions and definitions about civil war have then shaped subsequent European analyses as concepts of civil war developed side by side with the emergence of sovereign states in Europe. For it is paradoxical, you need a large enough agreed upon state in order to have a civil war within it. Civil wars have shaken monarchies and have spawned generations of polemics about whether monarchies or republics are more susceptible to them. The question of civil war has also shaped debates about the morality and propriety of rebellions and inter insurrections. What is one person's historically necessary revolution, for example, is another's illegal insurgency, just as one person's war of liberation is another's irresponsible civil war. As Professor Armitage notes in his book, it's easy to perform the conjugation. I am a revolutionary. You are a rebel. They are engaged in a civil war. Americans have had their own problems in defining civil wars, even after having a particularly intense and memorable one. In one of the more intriguing historical tidbits in his book, Professor Armitage notes that the US Congress did not settle upon the official name American Civil War for the conflict of 1861 to 65 until 1907. Even thereafter, that name continues to be contested, both by those who believe the original designation the War of the Rebellion, is more honest about the nature of the conflict, and those devotees of the lost cause who fear that calling it a civil war undermines the Confederacy's claim to separate legitimacy. Rather than a civil war over the future shape and government of a single state, the Daughters of the Confederacy, for example, prefer to refer to the recent unpleasantness or the war between the states. Today, more pro provocative wags on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line will throw around such terms as the War of Northern Aggression, uh, a term that happily does not appear in Professor Armitage's book. <laughs> Identifying civil wars is more than a semantic exercise, as any student of contemporary geopolitics can tell you. To describe a particular conflict as a civil war both draws on and encourages assumptions about the depth of the conflict and perhaps even about the legitimacy of the combatants. Civil wars also raise difficult questions about how the outside world should react, balancing the claims of national sovereignty against the interests of the international community is no easy task, especially if the international community is itself divided on the question of which side has the superior claim to legitimacy. As ongoing debates over Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, just to name three, make all too clear, peace can mean very different things to different combatants and can require political compromises that may be easier to demand from others than to provide ourselves. Outsiders will claim that the solution to a civil war is a power sharing arrangement, but if it were that easy to share power, there would not have been a civil war in the first place. So what is a civil war? How exactly does it differ from other sorts of wars? How is the meaning of the term changed over time? What special obligations do civil wars impose on the combatants, on the outside world, or on historians who try to make sense of them? These questions and yours will guide us in conversation with our guest, Professor David Armitage. <clears throat> Go ahead and applaud. He, he deserves it. David Armitage is the Lloyd C. Blankbein Professor of History and the former Chair of the Department of History at Harvard University. Educated at the University of Cambridge and at Princeton, Professor Armitage is a prize-winning teacher and writer. But Professor Armitage has lectured on six continents and is the author-editor of 16 books, among them The Ideological Origins of the British Empire, which won the Longman History Today Book of the Year Award, The Declaration of Independence, A Global History, which was a Time Literary Supplement Book of the Year, The Foundations of Modern International Thought, and The History Manifesto. His works have been translated into Arabic, Chinese, Danish, Dutch, French, Greek, Italian, Japanese, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish, with others soon to appear in German, Korean, and Polish, for those of you scoring at home. In 2008, 
Harvard named him a Walter Channing Cabot Fellow for achievements and scholarly eminence in the fields of literature, history, or art. In 2015, he received Cambridge University's highest degree, the Lit D. He is a corresponding member of the Real Academy de la Historia, Madrid, a corresponding fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and an honorary fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. A world-renowned scholar and a friend of FPRI, we are delighted to have him with us tonight. Welcome, David Armit. Thank you so much for having me back. It's always a huge pleasure to be here at FPRI. My third time, third time. Third already. time already. Well, that's good. Well, we'll try. We'll make mm -hmm. it. To, we'll make it worth your while and worth everybody else's while too. I want to start by asking you a, a, a question about your own history, in the sense of what led you to decide to write a book about the history of civil wars. Mark Twain allegedly has a line that history sometimes rhymes, mm -hmm. and this book came out of a rhyme between two histories. I was working at the Huntington Library in Southern California, that beautiful library and art collection mm -hmm. uh, outside Pasadena, um, in 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. Many of you here may remember that was the height of the violence of the Second Gulf War mm -hmm. after the US-led invasion. I was reading there and then the papers of Francis Lieber, mm -hmm the author of the first codification of the laws of war, the so-called Lieber Code, written in the middle of the US, late unpleasantness, mm. or civil war, as it later came to be called. Lieber was having terrible trouble defining civil war in that code. At exactly the same moment I was reading his letters about how hard it was to define civil war, there was a battle going on about the naming and therefore the framing mm -hmm. of that violence that was going on across the world at that exact same moment that I was looking through those archival boxes. It wasn't, it wasn't an insurgency, it wasn't a rebellion. Some people were saying it was a civil war. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, here's Lieber in 1862, 1863, worrying about what a civil war is. Here we are in 2006, 2007, worrying about what a civil war is. Maybe these are two points mm -hmm. in a much longer history. And maybe I should think about telling at least part of that history. Were you at the Huntington to do something else? And I was. then discovered Lieber? Yeah. I was. Should we ask what that project was? Uh, that's a still ongoing project on John Locke and his interest in English colonies in the Atlantic world of the 17th century, which I have yet to finish. I was derailed for a mere 10 years by, by this little book here. <laughs> but I'll get back to the project I was supposed to be working on. Don't tell the director of the library. <laughs> Sorry, that's a good, a good level of, of optimism, mm -hmm. right? That they will mm -hmm. always, you can always come back to it. So what is the connection between the concept of civil war and the emergence of, of political order? Um, uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is how it takes some time before there are uh, structures big enough so that you can have a civil war within them. Mm -hmm. So the, the Peloponnesian War is not a civil war, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the struggle between Caesar and Pompey is. Mm -hmm. uh, even though one could argue that the uh, Peloponnesian War takes place, takes place within a much smaller area of the world. And so what makes one a civil war and one not? Two things. One, you've already alluded to, scale. Mm -hmm. uh, the Greek conflicts, internal conflicts within Greek city-states were on a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were aggregated into an idea of a war among the Hellenes themselves mm -hmm. within what we might call an ethnic conception of what it meant to be Greek or to mm -hmm. be living as a community on the Greek peninsula. But the, uh, the Greeks themselves never talk about their internal conflicts as a civil war, a war among fellow citizens. They mm -hmm. talk about it as a war within the clan, a war within what we might translate loosely as a kind of extended family, a mm -hmm. war within the Hellenes, sometimes even a war within the household. Mm -hmm. So either at the very large level of all of these people with a common stock, a common root, or within the household itself, but never at the level of what we would think of as a state. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to the Romans, uh, they have to invent a new term, a term uh, that translates literally as civil war, in our and many other languages, bellum civile, mm -hmm. a war among citizens. The Romans tended to name their wars after the enemy that they fought, mm -hmm. uh, Jugurtha, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, they name it after an enemy who was not supposed to be an enemy at all, their fellow citizens, Kives mm -hmm. uh, in Latin. Uh, 
Uh, Bellum Civile was among fellow citizens within first the city of Rome and then the larger uh, Italian peninsula and then as the wars themselves expanded over the course of almost a century across the entire Mediterranean world, the known world as mm -hmm. far as the Romans themselves were concerned. So first there's scale and then there's the idea that there's a war among citizens, not something the Greeks had, something the Romans had on a larger scale, but also paradoxically with that intimacy of recognition among the enemies themselves. And so did, did slave uprisings count as civil wars? Like did, the, did Spartacus's uprising count as a civil war in the eyes of the Romans? The Romans were very good at naming wars. In mm -hmm. this case, uh, they saw a very different set of enemies there. These were selvi, mm -hmm. not kives. Mm -hmm. So rather than a civil war, it was a servile war, a war against slaves. And they were very clear that slaves were not and could not be citizens. So a war against them was indeed a war against a hostile other, mm -hmm. an external enemy, even within the bounds of, of Rome itself. So a servile war and a civil war were distinctly different from each other. Sometimes they intersected with each other at different points in Roman history, but those two kinds of war were kept quite separate from each other because of the nature of the enemies and of the intimacy between the enemies or lack thereof. And this question of intimacy, does that mean that the person who starts a civil war is automatically a, a villain, an enemy of the people? Or, or how did the Romans distinguish between uh, civil wars that were started for good reasons and ones that were started for bad reasons? Oh, well, those who started them always argue that they uh, were starting them for good reasons. Julius right. Caesar is the classic example. Right. Uh, he uh, said he was dis defending uh, Rome itself against uh, an aggressive and corrupt Senate. Uh, it was always necessary for the Romans when starting a war to give a justification for uh, uh, a defensive war. It could never be aggressive war. It had to be a defensive war. So even Caesar himself uh, gave what to him and to his followers was a convincing explanation for the enemy he was fighting, the just reasons for uh, uh, conducting a campaign against them, and therefore salving his own conscience that what he was engaged in was not a civil war. And indeed, if you read Caesar's mm -hmm. own account of what we now call the civil war, though he never used that title, he never uses the term in his own voice. Uh, and does he never use it because he knows that civil war is a terrible thing and so he would never want to be responsible for Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yes, yes. He doesn't want to term it that because that would be an acknowledgement that it was in fact a war that should not be a war, an illegitimate war against fellow citizens. It was a defensive war, uh, but he could never bring himself uh, to use those words. And for many <coughs> decades for the Romans, civil war was the war that dared not speak its name. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, it didn't stop them from having them. Not at all. Right. And having them over and over again, uh, decade after decade, for more than a century, a whole sequence of civil wars, which causes what we might now think of as a crisis of conscience for the Romans. Why did we have so many uh, civil wars? Why did the community continue to be torn apart? Was there some great moral failing at the very heart or the foundation of Rome itself that led to these fissures, this bloodshed, this tearing of entrails, as one of their poets? put it, so a lot of self-questioning goes into the whole canon of Roman history, mm -hmm. and that canon of Roman history, thinking about why civil wars recurred, what the connection between the different conflicts was, and what moral failing, what curse, perhaps, was at the heart of them, cascades down the centuries to influence uh, later conceptions of civil war deep into the 19th century. And am I correct, then, that this uh, the, the sense that civil wars are terrible and that the best thing that could happen is the end of civil wars then becomes a justification for the empire. And in retrospect, right, it becomes a, it's the, the heroism of Augustus is that he puts an end to civil wars. That's a very important ideological foundation for what we now call the Augustan age mm -hmm. that he, uh, by bringing empire, by restoring monarchy uh, in that form to Rome itself, had brought back peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of his ideologues and some of the historians of the Roman Civil War say that that was the solution. Uh, it wasn't uh, a brokered peace agreement, it wasn't international supervision, it wasn't even power sharing, it was the return of monarchy, the reestablishment of hierarchy, and the reign of Augustus himself, which brought that worldwide peace. And of course, that feeds into Christian vision of history as well, mm -hmm. with authors like St. Augustine, for instance, mm -hmm. who uh, are very interested in the relationship between Christianity and Rome's history as well. And uh, Augustine, in his City of God, writes the longest history of the Roman Civil Wars, though it's buried in that enormous work where uh, he absolves uh, Christianity 
uh, for, against the charge of having undermined mm -hmm. the stability of Rome itself by staying, saying, well, Rome was unstable for decades, even centuries before Jesus was born. It was not Christianity that brought that destructive instability to Rome itself. It was the, uh, this curse within Roman history. Uh, it was Christianity which had finally brought peace. It was not Augustus. Uh, for Augustine, it was pure coincidence that uh, Jesus had been born in the reign of the great emperor. <laughs> and so in, th in that sense, uh, uh, Augustine was defending Christianity against Gibbon's charge 1400 years before Gibbon made it. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. Um, I am curious for, for the way that the Romans talk about civil war and, and, and uh, in Roman history, since I have you here, that even if civil war is a terrible thing and people who start civil wars should be terrible, and even if Caesar, Julius Caesar, had a guilty conscience about it, uh, the fact that he started a civil war did not necessarily make him a villain in the eyes of, of Romans, outside of, but uh, with, the, with the possible mm -hmm. Pharsalia, mm -hmm. who tries to make Julius Caesar the villain. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting that that charge has never really stuck to Caesar, or am I, am I missing something? Oh, I think it has. It has uh, right. I mean, just to take one uh, example, in, in his final exile at the end of his life, Napoleon, mm -hmm. uh, obsessively reading over the records of past uh, uh, generals like himself, rereads uh, uh, Caesar's account of the civil wars. And at the moment where he gets to the crossing of the Rubicon, uh, he says, this is the moment when Julius Caesar uh, committed his great crime, declared anathema, crossed the line between military command and civilian yeah. command within Rome itself, and breached uh, that great division that the Romans had set up. This was a, a chilling moment for Napoleon, recognizing the brilliance of Julius Caesar's generalship, but also recognizing that a moral line had been crossed just as the River Rubicon had been crossed at that moment as well. So that ambivalence uh, a, a moral is, line that, that Napoleon himself had crossed. Absolutely, well, yes. Right? I think he recognized himself in some of that, definitely. Interesting. And that uh, the, the, the search for, uh, for role models is, mm -hmm. is very difficult. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but this, so did civil wars exist before we started calling them that? I argue in the book that they didn't, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it was the Romans themselves who conceptualized civil wars that way for the first time. Mm -hmm. I say, in fact, they invented civil war. They needed new terms. They right. needed a new language right. to describe something that they knew was distinctly different. So Cicero, for instance, one of the great observers uh, of Rome's civil wars, looks back to the Greeks and says, well, the Greeks had dissensions, seditions, tumults, but we had something different something more horrifying in a way, uh, but on a larger scale, much more fundamental in, in tearing apart the community itself. We had pestifera bella cavilia, uh, those plaguey civil wars. So the Romans recognized there was something different going on. I think it's not a merely semantic point. Nothing is ever merely semantic to an intellectual historian like me. Uh, I think what's important about that shift is uh, to assert that civil wars were invented Mm -hmm. uh, they were created uh, as artifacts of human culture rather than facts of human nature. And I think that's very important to state because many writers over the centuries have said civil war is something inherent in human nature itself. We're not just individually aggressive, one against another, but collectively aggressive. We are doomed forever to tear ourselves to pieces any time that we create a political community. It will inevitably dissolve into not just faction or sedition, but ultimately into uh, turbulent and destructive civil war. I want to argue against that in the book to say the Greeks didn't think in those terms, mm -hmm. the Romans knew they discovered something horrifying and new, uh, and one of my conclusions is that something that can be invented may in the end be disinvented or uninvented. We're not necessarily saddled with the prospect of the eternal recurrence of civil war in human affairs. Uh, if it had an identifiable beginning, it might also have an identifiable end. Well, not to not to jump to the to the end, but I, I'm curious what would a what would it take to uh, to disinvent civil war? Talk to uh, people in Colombia mm -hmm. in the past few months. Right. We have some very encouraging signs in recent years. First, the ending of the Sri Lankan civil war. Mm -hmm. Now, the Colombian civil war. Of course, that almost stumbled at the last post with the re referendum at the end of last year. But now, um, we come back from that. Uh, we're at an extraordinary moment. The first time, I think, in two centuries that the entire Western Hemisphere, the Americas, is free of civil war. Now, we'll only tell over time in the next 
few years, whether the long brokered peace agreement uh, in uh, Colombia will hold, whether the FARC rebels will hold to their side, the government will hold to their side, the international and regional community can uh, continue to supervise that particular peace agreement. But I think we have positive signs that we are finding ways, rather than just, as you mentioned at the beginning, through decisive military victory, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, negotiation, incorporation, amnesty, international supervision for bringing to an end even a conflict like Colombia's, which had been running for uh, almost 50 years uh, by the time it came to an end. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying very hard to be hopeful about these trends. Uh, you said quite correctly that <laughs> in the last 50 years or so, and certainly since 1989, there was a spike, an upsurge in the number of uh, conflicts generally called civil wars around the world. That seems to be beginning to taper off now. That mm -hmm. the, uh, the spike was in the early 2000s, and it's beginning to uh, dwindle a mm. little. A little. Maybe that's a positive sign. Uh, so I think there are hopeful signs that we may be on the way to, if not disinventing civil war, at least finding ways to cauterize some of its wounds to prevent its recurrence, which is one of the greatest dangers of civil wars and always has been. The Romans knew that 2,000 years ago um, in order to uh, begin at least to imagine removing this scourge from humanity. Um, is, is part of the hope that civil war can be removed, the idea that there are, there is a larger international community or there are larger bodies that can either step in or can encourage cooperation? The problem for the Romans was there was nobody bigger than Rome to tell mm -hmm. the Romans to stop fighting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so is this a sign that uh, as we move to a more global community, it's harder for local conflicts to remain local civil wars? I think we might have to say at this particular moment in our national international life, as we moved towards more global community, we can perhaps come back to that mm -hmm. in a moment, but mm -hmm. uh, think about a succession of endings of internal conflicts mm -hmm. uh, in Northern Ireland, in the Balkans, mm -hmm. Sri Lanka, Colombia, just to take some of the most important mm -hmm. uh, examples in recent years. In each of those cases, there was an element of international supervision, buy-in by various organs of the international community. It's not possible simply to get the warring sides, sometimes more than two warring mm -hmm. sides together around a table. Uh, you need international agreement and international supervision, uh, international cooperation, often to bring the parties to, a, to the table to begin with, to talk right. to each other, then to set conditions, and then to supervise and to monitor uh, the application of those conditions. So I think the ending of civil wars in the 21st century does depend to a great degree on that international buy-in as well as the intranational agreements that are made as well. Now, of course, at this very delicate moment when the entire architecture of uh, the post-war international order uh, is beginning to totter right. uh, and is indeed possibly under active attack uh, by uh, the current U.S. administration. Uh, we might say all bets are off about the long-term prospects for uh, that uh, international cooperation and supervision for the ending of long-term long, range, long -term conflicts. Uh, but, but we shall see. I, I try to remain hopeful. Well, as I well, say. well, well, well remaining hopeful yes. is good. We mm -hmm. like that around here. Um, I, I want to ask you an unfair question. Now that I have you warmed up, and that unlike is unlike the other ones. Yes. Unlike the other yeah, ones, yeah. that's right. <laughs> but um, uh, and that is, you know, your book is is a book of of uh, uh, impressive erudition, right? And, you know, without without question, right? Going back to the the classical tradition, really the entire scope of what uh, of uh, uh, Western history. I am curious, and and I don't know whether you've had a chance to speak to many specialists outside of the Western historical tradition. Um, how, if at all, do you think your story of civil wars and their use of terminology would change, or, or, or would it change at all, if you were able to include non-Western traditions, right? If we look at mm -hmm. 5,000 years of Chinese history, or Indian history, or, for, mm -hmm. for, um, or African history, that different parts of the world would, th do you think that the story is similar, um, or are there spe specific things about this uh, particular trend in if uh, the, the Western trend, Greeks, Romans, Europeans, North Americans? I think it would change, and there are aspects of it which I, I have indeed discussed with uh, specialists <coughs> in other areas, all of whom say no one has attempted the kind of long-range history for my area, mm -hmm. the, the Arab tr Arabic mm -hmm. traditions, the Chinese right. traditions that I've attempted here. So mm -hmm. uh, I hope very much that this might encourage others to reconstruct 
uh, similar histories that mm -hmm. can then be brought into dialogue. And I say at the beginning of the book, there are at least three other traditions of which I'm aware. There's a Greek one, which I do talk about a little, mm -hmm. the Greek idea of stasis, mm -hmm. uh, which is their nearest equivalent for faction shading towards something that we might call civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a Chinese tradition, which also gets imported into Japanese as well. Uh, the key Chinese term is Naisan, which means literally internal war. It's not mm -hmm. civil war. Mm -hmm. Again, this mm -hmm. idea of being fought among fellow citizens, I think, is critical to the tradition I, I'm uh, dealing with here. So there's that Chinese, East Asian tradition as well. Um, and then there is a tradition within um, uh, Arabic thought, Arabic politics, Arabic poetry, and uh, Quranic traditions as well, uh, of talking about fitna, mm -hmm. uh, a, m a very complex term, sometimes used to describe religious schism, for instance, between Sunni and Shia mm -hmm. um, uh, traditions, also used to describe faction, rebellion, and occasionally in the place that we might use civil war in European and mm -hmm. Latinate derived languages, mm -hmm. for instance. I was at a conference actually a few months ago where uh, I was asked to talk with specialists about the parallel political vocabularies of um, sedition, uprising, mm -hmm. schism, mm -hmm. uh, civil war, revolution, and the parallel terms in Arabic. And we, we noticed some moments, for instance, in the 19th century where there were clear parallels that in Arabic, a difference between something that might be called uh, revolution as against something that call, would be called civil war. There was a difference between the mm -hmm. comparable mm -hmm. terms in Arabic as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there are uh, some interesting parallels. And what I would like to see more worked on is, is for instance, to look at uh, the language of conflict in Syria mm -hmm. since 2011, mm -hmm. uh, to look at the ways in which these quotes Western, or we might say Mediterranean conceptions of civil war are channeled through right. the organs of global governance, through the World Bank, the UN, the International Committee of the Red Cross. So this is a global language now, even if originally it emerged from Rome, Europe, the Americas, how that intersects with um, Arabic understandings of conflict and what misunderstandings, maybe what common understandings emerge from the different uh, sets of conceptions and the implications that come from the historic traditions lying behind those ideas. So who gets to decide uh, that a conflict is a civil war? Um, is, this, is this a privilege that's re uh, reserved to the people fighting it? Or can the, uh, or is, are there good historical examples of the idea that this is a civil war is something that can be imposed upon a conflict from the outside and accepted by the people who are fighting it? I just mentioned Syria right. a moment ago, and there's a very good example there, I think, that will uh, 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 speak very much to your question. So uh, from late 2011 into the first half of 2012, uh, there were many reports circulating for obvious reasons from Syria itself of people saying uh, in their own languages and in translation, we are suffering a civil war here in Syria by, I think, June of 2012, something like 17,000 people mm -hmm. had already perished in that conflict. It was in that month that the International Committee of the Red Cross said for the first time to the international community, to the world effectively, what is going on in Syria is a non-international armed conflict. That is the precise term of art used by international law, international humanitarian law, to denote or define what in common speech we would call a civil war. And, and I, that, oh. I'm interested in precisely that gap mm -hmm. uh, of understandings on the ground, the experience of those suffering the conflict itself. They knew that they were suffering something that they could call a civil war, mm -hmm. or on the side, the Assad regime, of course, was calling it a rebellion or an insurgency against their authority. But it took more than six months and 17,000 deaths for the international community or one of its most important uh, representatives to say, this is a non-international armed conflict. Why does that matter? Mm -hmm. It matters because once that has been verified or validated through uh, an organization like the Red Cross, then it's possible for humanitarian aid to be brought into a country uh, which has a non-international armed conflict. Um, it's uh, possible to apply aspects of the Geneva Conventions, mm -hmm. which would not be applicable if this were just conceived of as an internal police action by an authority over those fighting against it. And in some cases, in similar cases, for example, in the Balkans Wars, it's possible to start collecting evidence for potential war crimes trials after uh, the conflict itself concludes. So a great deal hangs 
on that determination that what is happening is or is not a civil war or in that more uh, specific legal language a non-international armed conflict. Because once you've declared it a civil war then you can go you can essentially go around the existing government or you can, right. you can ignore the existing government. Yeah so you crossed a barrier uh, from as it were seeing it like the state itself, mm -hmm. seeing it like the Assad regime, this is something happening within our own territory, uh, it's up to us to apply our own laws and our own conception of necessary force to uh, put down a rebellion or an insurgency. Uh, once you recognize it as a civil war, or again a non-international armed conflict, then that gives rights of belligerency mm -hmm. to both sides uh, and also allows the international community to have an interest, a legal interest, which then may also become a political interest in what is happening on the ground and there we get into the much more murky and contested political questions about intervention yes. that arise from civil war as well. Humanitarian aid is one thing, monitoring of potential uh, abuses or war crimes is another, but the idea of intervention by outside powers, especially military intervention, uh, of course becomes very fraught at that point and there's a long history uh, to in, that. Uh, indeed, and, and history in both sides, right? Because mm -hmm. the way that you describe the Syrian situation is you call it a civil war and the international community can can intervene mm -hmm. to protect or to, to ameliorate. But at the same time, when, say, the United States has been involved in conflict in Vietnam, um, one of the arguments made by those who wanted the United States to stop being involved was to say, the Vietnamese are fighting a civil war and we have no business there. Um, and how, what is your sense of the, uh, the ways that civil war, the designation of civil war, has both encouraged the world to care but also encouraged the world to stay out? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly as you say. It can go go in both directions. Right. So again, let's go back to the uh, to the Second Gulf War, where that debate that sparked my book uh, about whether or not to call it a civil war hung precisely on that, and there were opposed sides on that de on that designation for exactly that reason. Some sides were saying, if we call it a civil war, it opens up the possibility for. Uh, continued intervention uh, by the US uh, and other powers to ramp up their forces to support one side or the other. Others uh, were saying, well, if you call it a civil war, and here I think they very much had the memories of the, the Balkans wars, the wars mm -hmm. in the Horn of Africa after, after 1989. If you call it a civil war, it's it's an ethnic feud. It's something which is based in highly local, very contested, deeply atavistic um, right. Uh, conflicts within a particular area. It's something that we as the international community or, or international power should stay away from. A civil war should burn itself out. It's nothing to do with us. So it can actually work in, in both directions. The latter one is more in a more informal way of saying stay away. The idea of intervention is a way of, is a way of saying um, if you recognize one of the opposing sides as belligerents, then maybe you have a duty to go to their aid if you believe they need aid. And of course, right. that was one of the great ethical and political issues in relation to the Syrian conflict as well. Indeed. Still it, is. Mm -hmm. it remains yeah. to this day. That, that red line was crossed, but no action was taken. So um, I, wanna, I, I want to invite the audience to, uh, if, if there are any questions, we have the microphone. Is there a microphone? It's in the back. Yes, uh, we'll, start up, we'll start up here. Thank you, um, both of you. I was curious about how when one starts a civil war, if one was a citizen because of conquest. For example, in the Confederacy, if they had gotten Britain to support them, um, that, that could have been a different outcome. In, in the Arab world, as part of the Turkish Empire, they were encouraged by outside intervention to assert there. So that would be viewed in Turkey as a civil war. So the notion of um, whether you are civil and how far back you go in your citizenry up, the, up that ancestry tree, and whether it was under duress mm -hmm. or by conquest that you got stuck as being called a citizen as opposed to an independent entity subjugated by you and therefore entitled to retribution. And um, I guess that's my main, my main issue is the notion of, it's actually con convoluted because you can also have surrogates. Mm -hmm. Many civil wars 
are encouraged to, during the Cold War. We would have been delighted to have uh, Georgia and uh, um, any, any uh, Muslim territories of uh, China or Russia in the old Soviet Union exert their rights to be uh, independent, for example. We would have encouraged that. And we were bumping into Russia every other country, basically using them as clients in our civil war. So I'm, I'm a little stuck on this notion. Of yeah, so, this, so the question of, of uh, uh, how, I, I guess this is the distinction between a, a rebellion of a group that simply never really felt like they were part of the Kiwis mm -hmm. to begin with mm -hmm. versus a civil war between uh, well-established communities. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This was a problem the Romans faced. Mm -hmm. And what do we, to, today does it matter mm -hmm. uh, uh, as far as identifying a conflict as a civil war? Oh, I think it matters enormously. Mm -hmm. And just to go back to the Romans again, the Romans had a name for, uh, or one name for that kind of war was a social war, a war among their socii or their allies. And they recognize, recognize that as something different from a war against slaves or a war against citizens. But it struck me as you were talking that I think all of the examples that you gave were examples of what we would now call and were sometimes called at the time wars of secession. Mm -hmm. That is of groups breaking away from an empire or another state. Uh, and that's indeed one quite peculiar kind of civil war, which I think really sharpens exactly the issue that you're talking about. And you refer to the Confederacy, and I think it's not the first time that this issue gets, gets ventilated, but it's a very important one, precisely that division that we were joking about, or Ron right. was joking about before, between a war between the states or a war of the rebellion is, is absolutely about that sense of, well, was it a legitimate secession which created a new state or states, which were then outside the former host state, battling against them, no longer fellow citizens, but arrayed in an international war, a war between states, or as Abraham Lincoln saw it, a war of the rebellion. He talks about the conflict six times more often as a war of rebellion rather than a civil war, for instance. So I think you've got a third term, war of rebellion, civil war, and then a war between states in, in many of these examples. And I wouldn't want to equate the Confederacy with various anti-colonial struggles, though that was certainly one way in which uh, some of the Confederate propagandists at the time thought about it. But think of an example like the Algerian War in the, in the, uh, the, in, um, in the early 1960s, for instance. A lot uh, was hanging at the time on whether or not that was a civil war. For the French authorities, uh, that was a war within metropolitan France with the little ditch of the Mediterranean separating French people from French people, but that was a war within metropolitan France. That was a civil war uh, for the FLN and their supporters. Of course, it was an anti-colonial conflict. And there's a lot of debate at exactly that moment in the international community, among political scientists uh, as well, who are trying to define different forms of conflict in the context of the Cold War and its proxy wars and anti-colonial wars. And they come up with definitions of civil war which deliberately exclude anti-colonial mm -hmm. wars as something quite different, mm -hmm. and possibly illegitimate as well. So you touched, on, I think, on a very important issue about first secession and then about anti-colonial or anti-imperial wars, whether or not they should be seen as civil wars. They're often seen as civil wars by the colonial masters. It's happening within our territory, within right. our empire, within our metropolitan. And, which is why right. other, mm. and, and that, that uh, the outside world should stay out. Precisely, because it, and exactly. It's not right. just a civil war, it's, it's a rebellion. Right. Let's go, mm -hmm. question right here, this young gentleman right here. You alluded to the relationships between civil wars and revolutions, mm. but you didn't really develop the distinction. The French Revolution, a civil war in France. Uh, there were certainly those at the time who conceived it that way, both inside France itself, uh, in an area like the <coughs> Vendée, for instance, where tens of thousands of people uh, were slaughtered. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the debates in the National Assembly about uh, the civil war that was going on in France after 1789, and then also counter-revolutionary thinkers like Edmund Burke, for instance, um, described the aftermath of the French Revolution in the early 1790s as a civil war precisely in the terms that we were just talking about, as uh, um, a moment for intervention. Burke described two nations having been created, one supporting the monarchy, the Bourbon monarchy, one supporting Jacobin republicanism. When two nations were fighting each other, Burke said, uh, they could uh, be conceived of as being like two nations 
on the international uh, stage mm -hmm. and it was legitimate for outside powers to support one or the other and for Burke that was an argument for counter-revolutionary action by the monarchical powers of Europe, by Britain or by Austria for instance at that time. So there are a lot of different dimensions in which the French Revolution was going to be, was, was thought of at the time as a civil war. I thought you were going to ask about the American Revolution and I could certainly talk more about that since I believe we're in Philadelphia. We are indeed. Just two we minutes walk from Independence <laughs> Hall and Constitution <laughs> Hall. There's a lot to be said about the American Revolution as, as a civil war. Well, and I, actually, to, to piggyback on that before we get mm. to the next question, right, is that, you know, as somebody who's written a book about the international history of the Declaration of Independence, um, that the, uh, the Declaration goes out of its way to say, right, that these United States, that they are free and independent states. So when the, that the, the certainly from the perspective of the folks at Mechanics Hall, um, uh, it was not a civil war anymore. On well, the other hand, uh, Jefferson perhaps was not quite so sure, mm -hmm. since he still uses that term British brethren. British brethren. British sure. brethren, so he can't mm -hmm. let go of that commonality, and that's one of the paradoxes, I think perhaps the most fundamental paradox about civil war that I point to in the book, that uh, we recognize commonality at the moment of deepest enmity. So if I call you a fellow citizen in the context of a civil war, even as I have a sword at your throat mm -hmm. or you're staring down the barrel of my gun, we're recognizing each other as part of the same community, mm -hmm. even at that moment of tearing it apart. And I think there's something of that in Jefferson's inability to give up that common sense of Britishness and indeed of fraternity mm -hmm. at that moment of division. Think back a year, again, since we're here in Philadelphia, to the first less famous declaration published by the Continental Congress, the Declaration on the Taking Up of Arms. Mm -hmm. The very last sentence of that document uh, uh, ends by saying, uh, we are taking these various moves, the Olive Branch Petition, the, the Declaration on Taking Up of Arms, in order, quotes, to avoid the calamities of civil war. So in July 1775, that language is still very explicit. And the, I think the first use of the term American Civil War I've found is not in 1861. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in 1774 and 1775 mm -hmm. uh, that uh, contemporaries on both sides of the Atlantic are thinking of this as a civil war, perhaps part of a sequence of British civil wars from the 1640s, possibly the Glorious Revolution, on to the 1770s. But it's taking place in America. So that's the first American Civil War. Then the War of 1812 gets called the American Civil War. So what happens in 1861-65 is at least the third American Civil War <laughs> in that sense. Um, I want to take some more questions from the audience right here, please. It seems to me that it's very, the whole idea that you're bringing up is, depends on people's views and it's really after the fact we now think Syria is in a civil war, but of course Turkey is fighting against Kurdish terrorists. They're not in a civil war, although the people, the Kurds, have lived there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Who wins in naming people? Who wins in deciding? Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot of rights that apply to that. Mm -hmm. Different people win at different times, a historian has to say that, it's all very complicated, but uh, when the International Committee of the Red Cross says in Syria that what's happening is a civil war, those who had been formally called insurgents or rebels by the Assad regime, they win recognition, they win legitimacy in the eyes of the international community. What often happens in retrospect, to take your initial point, is that what was called a civil war gets rebranded perhaps as a revolution. A successful civil war is sometimes called retrospectively a revolution. So it depends, as it were, which snapshot you're taking in time of a conflict, whether you're at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, or after the conflict. The valence, the meaning, the application of the term civil war can, can change quite drastically. Uh, is it something that you want to embrace? Perhaps it is during a conflict if it gives you uh, rights of recognition by the international community against an oppressive regime. Uh, if it's after a, a civil war that you've won, uh, then you might want to cleanse the stain of civil war by saying that was a, that was a revolution. So the American Civil War of the 1770s gets retrospectively rebranded as the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet the American Civil War doesn't get, uh, get rebranded as a revolution. 
Uh, not retrospectively, not retrospect a, a, because it failed from the point of view of the Confederacy, the lost cause, uh, to, coin, to coin a phrase, but it was t thought of as a revolution by many in the Confederacy, the second American revolution. Mm -hmm. They were going back behind mm -hmm. the compact of the Constitution itself mm -hmm. to rerun the American Revolution on the same grounds, which is one of the reasons why, for instance, many of the Confederate secession documents deliberately take paragraphs from the 1776 mm -hmm. Declaration to say we, we are recovering our rights as free and independent states right. uh, to fight again for uh, the, the freedom and independence of those states. And, and Lincoln's very careful, right, to make sure that he argues that the, the, the Union is not fighting to change the United States. Right? Even right. though one, in retrospect, historians point out that the United States after 1865 is a different place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but the, the Union never claims that they're fighting to transform the United States, they're merely fighting to save it. Indeed, and nor does the Confederacy ever claim, as far as I know, uh, that they were attempting to take over the entire United States for a totally different regime. So it's, a, uh, it's not a conventional civil war in that sense, which we tend to, or one species of civil war is mm -hmm. uh, a battle between two or sometimes more parties for control of a territory mm -hmm. and legitimate authority over that, that state or territory or nation or people. That was not part of Confederate war aims. Interesting. In the back here. Yes. Hello. Um, Thank you. Um, you spoke of the different vocabulary and cultural perspectives, Arabic versus, um, and I was thinking, I think a practical application, you say, okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's this kind of a conflict, so these people have these rights and so forth. But I'm wondering, w within the construct of what you're thinking there, is do you see a, an opportunity to build bridges between the vocabularies and the cultures that might help untie the knot of that keeps conflicts going that might otherwise, um, you know, there might be a more successful intervention or not to. In a very modest way, yes. I mean, that's that's part of the aim of the book is to make. Uh, uh, international lawyers, people in or organizations like the World Bank and the Red Cross, a little bit more aware of the, the baggage that terms like civil war or non-international armed conflict carry with them, that they're, uh, they're sometimes used as if they were objective facts about particular kinds of conflict. I try to show that they've always, really since the very beginning, since the term civil war was coined by the Romans for the first time, always been very contested, very ideological, very political in that sense, so need to be handled with care. And I think some sensitivity to that fact, but also sensitivity to the fact that the experiences of people on the ground need to be listened to at least mm -hmm. as much as the internal conversations of the experts as well. And so that gap that I was pointing mm -hmm. to in Syria between the experience of those who knew that they were suffering a civil war and were saying that uh, to, the, to the wider world and that gap between the expert determination that yes, indeed, this is a civil war, that gap probably needs to be closed and we need to listen more to uh, the victims mm -hmm. of these conflicts mm -hmm. um, and, to, as, as you say, to bring together more of a concrete and helpful dialogue between the different parties, those in the outside world in the international community as well as those within it, uh, because it's only through that long-term dialogue that you can create any possibility of a lasting peace, uh, both internally and with yeah. the negotiation and supervision of, out, of outside uh, organizations as well. So I think we have time for one last question. In your introduction, you had mentioned, um, prefer referenced in the Peloponnesian Wars, mm -hmm. indicating that they were civil wars. In the second Peloponnesian War, you're dealing with Carthage and Athens. Why would you consider that a civil war? Uh, uh, me, I was, I guess I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily considering it, I was, I was asking the question is whether, you know, why is it that these Greek conflicts, that the Greeks didn't refer to them as civil wars, right? Even though, uh, you know, Athens and Sparta were not, were not nearly as far apart um, physically. Uh, and yet that wasn't a civil war, yet the, 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 the conflict between Caesar and Pompey later on ends up being fought over the entire Mediterranean basin. Right? Mm -hmm. Caesar campaigns in Spain, he campaigns, they end up fighting in northern Greece. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, in part it's because Rome is bigger, so the war is taking place within it. And yet, I, I, I guess I, uh, and this we can come back to this as a, as a final uh, 
question to wrestle with, right, is this idea that um, you need to have, you know, in Federalist 10, Madison says, you need a larger republic is better because factions will never get big enough to control anything, and that they will, they will check each other. Yet once you get a republic or an institution that is large enough for there to be multiple factions, eventually you can have pretty intense conflicts that spread out over a long period and then call the continued existence of the republic into question. Going back to the secessionist issue, that if, if it's so big, if we can't agree, why are, you know, who gets to say we need to stay in here? And maybe we should just separate. And so I am, I'm fascinated by this interaction between civil war and sovereignty, or civil war and a common, that, that just as you, when you said I have to have, it feels different when I call you citizen as mm -hmm. I am holding my sword at you, when I do that, right, I'm making a, uh, a value judgment about this very conflict, right? Probably arguing that it is unnecessary, right? Why are you making me do this? Mm -hmm. And I wonder then, so to, to actually get it to a question, is are we saying that what makes civil war so painful and why it matters so much when we call a conflict that is they are the wars more than any other that we wish never are fought? We wish they are never fought, but they have to be fought because they tend to be contentions over the most fundamental and intractable values that we hold dear. And I think uh -huh. that's something else which is terrifying about the prospect of civil war. If we think of um, Clausewitz, if we think of uh, politics as civil war by other means, politics as the attempt to manage mm -hmm. fundamental and irreconcilable difference over basic and fundamental values mm -hmm. up to but not past the point of violence. Mm -hmm. We have to ask ourselves, when does politics become civil war again? What condition, under what conditions might that happen? I'm very worried by many things about what's happening in the world at the moment, in Europe, but especially in the United States. One of the things that worries me particularly, as someone very sensitive to this language now, is the increasing use of the language of civil war in Europe and in the US at the moment. I hope that's not a harbinger of this breaking apart of politics itself, that managing difference over fundamental values uh, should not, could not, would not, but maybe it will break out into something more like open violence, especially when we have powerful parties inciting, mm -hmm. not just verbal violence, but even physical violence again. Um, so I, I, I think we may be at a moment where we're seeing that incursion of fundamental difference over basic but deeply held values uh, coming, if not to physical blows at these two, verbal violence at a moment of hyper-partisanship, of deep investment by both sides in the, the rightness of the worldview within which their values are nested and which give succor to those values. So I think we are at an inflection point at the moment and it worries me greatly about where we might be heading now. That's not exactly as hopeful as some of your earlier comments, but I no. think it's mm -hmm. an honest mm -hmm. place to end. Mm -hmm. Certainly mm -hmm. if, we, if we are co concerned about what future civil wars will be like, we can learn a lot by reading your book and understanding mm. what civil mm -hmm. wars are there. So David Armitage, thank you very much. for Thank you so much. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this conversation uh, had to come to an end, mm -hmm. uh, but we thank you for your attention. And the conversation continues at Geopolitics with Granary, right? We go on every month. Uh, we hope that uh, if you liked what you heard and saw tonight, that you will tell a friend, that you will bring a friend next time. Today's conversation is the beginning. The world goes on. Um, we will be back at you next month with a slightly different program. Uh, but uh, FPRI would especially like to thank the National Liberty Museum for hosting us, as well as BNY Mellon uh, for their generous sponsorship and the Bradley Foundation. Um, we, uh, I wanted to keep up with future episodes of Geopolitics with Granary uh, and other events at FPRI. Please visit our website, fpri.org. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Um, you can follow the host of this program. I'm on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. But until the next time we meet, for all of us at FPRI, especially my colleagues in producing this program, Eli Gilman, Peyton Wendell, and Rachel Hemmler, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. That was Thank fun. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. I mm -hmm. hope that, uh, mm -hmm.
I, I, I couldn't remember if we had any copies of the book to share or not tonight, but I hope we can. Uh, well, there at least was only some downstairs to sign, but good. I'm not sure if they're going to be more at dinner. Okay, we'll, we shall good. see. Yeah. I just wanted to introduce myself Hi. briefly. Nice to meet you. I was a Harvard graduate student in history in the oh, 1960s. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Who I studied you? European intellectual history. Oh, I figured we couldn't avoid the subject. It would be dishonest. Yes, yes. 